Well, we are in 2 Samuel chapter 19. We're actually going to look at verse 31 through verse 26. I'm not trying to break records for the longest text, but we just there was no breaks in this. And so what I'm going to do, uh, just read selected passages about the main rebellion, which is Sheba's rebellion. And that will be our main storyline, but there's other things going on in this text. So you'll stay with me. Take a look, if you will, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 40 through 43, and then we'll look at some other passages in chapter 20. This is the Word of God. Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimam went on with him. And all the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel accompanied the king. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king. And said to the king, Why had our fathers, the men of Judah, stolen you away, and brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? Then all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative to us, why then are you angry about this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has anything been taken for us? But the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king. Therefore, we also have more claim in David than you. Why then did you treat us with contempt? Was it not our advice first to bring back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the words of the men of Israel. Continuing on. Now a worthless fellow happened. A worthless fellow happened to be there whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from following David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah remained steadfast to their king from the Jordan, even to Jerusalem. And now skipping down to verse 14 through verse 22. Now he, meaning Sheba, the rebel, went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, even to Beth Maaka, and all the, Be- the Beerites, and they were gathered together and also with him. They, meaning David's men, came and besieged him in Abel, Beth Maaka, and they, uh, they cast up a siege ramp against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab were wrecking destruction in order to topple the wall. Then a wise woman called from the city, Here, here! Please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. So he approached her and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I'm listening. Then she spoke, saying, Formerly they used to say, They will surely ask advice at Abel. And thus they ended the dispute. I am of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You are seeking to destroy a city, even a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Joab replied, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. Such is not the case. But a man from the hill country of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri, by name, has lifted up his hand against King David. Only hand him over, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman wisely came to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they were dispersed from the city, each to his tent. Joab also returned to the king at Jerusalem. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word and our time in it this morning. Let's pray. Well, if you were with us last week, David is on his way back to Jerusalem to reclaim his kingship. He produces a spirit of forgiveness. He refuses to execute Shimei, who had cursed the king earlier. And also he divides Mephibosheth and Ziba's land, realizing Mephibosheth was in all likelihood loyal to the king. We ended with some applications that each of us could ponder regarding Mephibosheth and his king, so our king Jesus as well. So we talked a little bit also about David's inordinate affections. Uh, we see that instead of taking care of some kingly business, he gets pr- fairly self-absorbed. And yet, it's interesting. After David loses his firstborn son, Amnon, there's really nothing much regarding grief. But with Absalom, it's overwhelming. He's inconsolable. Oh, my son, my son. 
Uh, Saeed brought a really good point up at the Lord's Supper this past week. Certainly, let's not deflect the pain and heartache of losing a child. And really, ultimately, what we find out is this is what the Father did with His own Son, Jesus Christ. And yet, it, uh, Tommy Nelson, listening to him the other day, he brought up a point. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of the patriarchs, as well as David, they had to give up their sons in different ways, unique ways. But yet, ultimately, we saw that that was a foreshadowing of the ultimate giving up of the Son in our Heavenly Father with His Son, Jesus Christ. So that, it's important to note, as Nelson quotes, when David says, my son, my son, David is not willingly giving up his son. Yet in the New Testament, our Father willingly gives up His Son in order to bring His other sons to glory. So what you hear is not, my son, my son, but my God, my God. Well, that was last week. Today we're going to look at Sheba's rebellion. We'll, we'll see that is the main uh, context here. And yet we'll also see another rebellion taking place. It's a covert rebellion. We'll call it a double rebellion here. And you may have wondered by reading the text, where is that rebellion? Well, let me point it out in just a little bit. And finally, we'll end the uh, sermon here on a happy note. There's a wise woman who saves the city. So what you're seeing here in chapter 20 is the same as chapter 19. David is enduring hard times. If you will, David is enduring bad things. R.C. Sproul was once asked, why do bad things happen to good people? His answer, I don't know. I've never met any good people. Certainly, that's true for us as well. The Bible's clear. Job chapter 5, verse 7, a man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upwards. Job 14, 1, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We live in a fallen world, ladies and gentlemen. What did you expect? Matthew Henry puts it this way, we must not think it strange while we are in the world if the end of one trouble be the beginning of another. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the text. We stopped last time at chapter 19, verse 30. We're going to uh, give you just a little bit of background before we go into Sheba's rebellion of one other character that helped David. Chapter 19, verse 31 through 39. There's an old, powerful man named Barzillai. Now, Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim, and he went on to the Jordan with the king to escort him over the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was very old, being 80 years old, and he had sustained the king, meaning provided food and shelter, while he stayed in Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. The king said to Barzillai, you cross over with me and I will sustain you in Jerusalem with me. But Barzillai said to the king, how long have I yet to live that I should go up to the king to Jerusalem? I am now 80 years old. Can I distinguish between good and bad? Or can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Or can I hear any more the voice of singing men and women? Why then shouldn't your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant would merely cross over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king compensate me with this reward? Please, let your servant return that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and my mother. However, there is your servant, Chimam, which was probably his son. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what is good in your sight. And the king answered, Chimam shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what is good in your sight, and whatever you require of me, I will do for you. All the people crossed over the Jordan, and the king crossed too. The king then kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his place. Who is Barzillai? Well, he is a rich, powerful man. He sustains David while he runs from Absalom. And David is merely just returning the favor here in his kindness. The Bible is very clear on his age. He's 80. And keep in mind, this is before the time of certain things like hearing aids or uh, other medicinal products that might be able to help him. And so he says, hey, I'm not going. Send this guy. But what I think is fascinating, though, is note he's using his wealth for the kingdom. For the kingdom. Matthew 6.33, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. All these things will be granted to you as well. This is what we see from Barzillai. What is he doing? 
He's investing in the Lord's work. He's sending his investment forward, if you will. It's interesting to note, if Absalom had won this rebellion against David, Barzillai would have been executed. There's no doubt about it. And I think it proves something out for us here at the chapel. And some of you do this quite well. And that is this. It's never too old to take risks for the kingdom of God. It's never. Never too old. As a matter of fact, we might even note this. Uh, I, I ran track, not very fast, but I ran it in the past. And I can tell you, when I saw the finish line, do you think I slowed down? No, it's a natural propensity to speed up. You can see it. You know the end is coming. So you go faster, not slower. And we certainly see that with Barzillai in his life. He's going full throttle for the kingdom. And so David offers to provide for him. He said, I really can't enjoy it like this one can. And so David says, okay, I'll bring him. So it seems like a happy ending. David is finally going home. But, and then another rebellion is taking place. We just read 40 through 43. I'll just draw your attention to it. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. He says, Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Shimon went on with him. The people of Judah and also half the people of Israel accompanied the king. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why had our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? So stop there, and we'll continue on. Here's what's going on here. Strife is breaking out between the southern part of the kingdom and the north. Um, primarily what's happening is that Judah has kind of taken their king, finally, and they said, okay, let's get him across the Jordan. Let's get him into Jerusalem. And so they, Judah has a lot of pride. He's our man. We've got Israel. What's going on with them? Well, they're jealous, of course. They even say, Hey, we have ten tribes to your two tribes. Now, lest you think you know the Scripture very well, who are those two tribes? It's not Judah and Benjamin, at least not in this case. It's, it's probably in all likelihood Judah and Simeon, because we're going to see the rebel is actually of Benjamin here. And Benjamin actually is considered at that time one of the northern tribes, though it was right next to Judah. So... Um, there's a seed of division that's taking place. Finally, by the time of David's grandson, the kingdom will be split in two. But you'll see hints of it right here, don't you? So let's take a look. We have a worthless man steps up named uh, Sheba. I'll read those. Now, a worthless fellow happened to be there whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, and he blew the trumpet. He said, we have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, so Israel. And by the way, do you note that he doesn't call him King David? He calls him son of Jesse. He's just a son of Jesse. That's all he is. So all the men of Israel withdrew from following David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah remained steadfast to their king from the Jordan even to Jerusalem. Then David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, the concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and placed them under guard and provided them with sustenance, but did not go into them. So they were shut up till the day of their death, living as widows. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Sheba, he is of the tribe of Benjamin, which is the former kingship of Saul, is of the tribe of Benjamin. He is called in the Hebrew, a man of Belial. That may not mean anything to you, but if you're Hebrew, you know exactly what that means. It's worthlessness. He's a troublemaker. Uh, the Bible uses this term Belial for the men of Sodom, the evil sons of Eli, Nabal, Satan in the New Testament is called Belial. Well, why is he called a Belial here? There's two reasons. Number one, he rejects the Lord's anointed. He rejects the Lord's anointed. He says there is no inheritance in the son of Jesse. He won't even call him the king. Well, we should note this. David was divinely appointed. Don't forget this. Divinely appointed by a prophet of God, Samuel. So it is not just simply removing your president and bringing in a new president, voting somebody else in. This is the Lord's anointed. Dr. Johnson writes about this. He says, man's revolt against Christ consists essentially of a rejection of the divine claim, just as Sheba was rejecting the divine claim of David to the kingship. So when men reject the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are really rejecting the beloved and authoritative Son of God. 
That's the first thing he does. The second thing he does wrong is he breaks the covenant. Did you catch his phrase? We have no portion in David. That is a complete rejection of the covenant that takes place in 2 Samuel 3 and 2 Samuel 5. The covenant that binds the king and all the tribes together. So he was rejected the Lord's anointed. He rejects the covenant. And he tells the northern tribes, y'all follow me. Now, I, I want to note this, and it's important to note as believers. What does God hate? Many things. He hates sin. But one thing that he hates also is he hates covenant breaking. He hates it. And I would say he especially hates it in his children. Uh, a couple of examples come to mind for me would be marriage. God hates divorce in Malachi 2.16. Except for biblical reasons that the Bible prescribes, God hates that covenant being broken. He despises it. And sadly, many times the church looks very, or maybe only slightly different than the world. Something else God hates is the covenant breaking when a person abandons the church. Ephesians 4.3, he says, Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Did you catch that phrase? Maintain the unity. We don't need to be reconciled as believers in Jesus Christ. We are already reconciled in Jesus Christ. We presently have the peace of Christ among us today. So what is our job to do? It's not to make peace. Our job is to maintain the peace. So when a person decides to abandon the body of Christ because someone has hurt you, you're not maintaining the unity. And this is what each of us is called to do. So if you've been wronged by that person, that person's repentant, you have to forgive him or her. Or you have never been forgiven. Is that correct? I think it is. The Lord's Supper, or rather the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts, what? As we also have forgiven our debtors. So David has just gotten out of a trial and he's back in another one. And we need to note that as believers. Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's one of the things Paul tells the people as he goes back and visits the churches he planted. It's almost like he goes, oh, one other thing you'll need to know, you're not getting out of trials in this life. And in all likelihood, they're going to get worse. Uh, Thomas Brooks wrote about this, the Puritan in 1659. He said this, God who is infinite in wisdom and matchless in goodness hath ordered our troubles, yea, many troubles, to come trooping upon us on every side. As our mercies, so our crosses seldom come single. They usually come treading one upon the heels of another. It's mercy that every affliction is not an execution, every correction not a damnation. You know, it's interesting, even the rabbis would speak about the importance of trials. And listen to what they say. They said, we learn in the sense of we learn in the trials that we may teach. Do you know that? When you go through the trials of life, you need to know that they're not all about you. They never have been. Uh, we talked about discipline oh, back in January, the different forms of discipline that God gives us, but one of them that He gives us in order for us to be of benefit to others, to edify others, that we can be teachers in this aspect. Let me remind you of a verse that you're very familiar with, Psalm 51, where David is confessing his sin before the Lord because of his adultery with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah. He says this in verse 10 through 12, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. You know what I forgot? I forgot verse 13. I just read you verse 10 through 12, but it's really not succinct without verse 13, which says this, then, then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What is David saying? David's saying, I am going through this horror that I brought upon myself. I'm reaping what I have sown. The Lord is going to forgive me, but then I've got work to do. I need to get in front of my lectern, if you will, with fellow believers and tell them about the great mercies of God. 
Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you're keeping your trials to yourself, you're in disobedience. Our job is to confess. Our job is to others through this. By the way, another great verse if you're looking for them, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, that speaks of Christ's sufferings and uh, Christ's comforts would come upon us. Why? For others that we in turn may likewise, they would share in our comforts, the comforts of Christ. So there's trials for us. There's the learning. But then we've got this other strange deal that's happening in verse 3 called David's concubines. And it's really a kind of a sad verse here. Uh, these ten concubines that David kept to watch over the house while he was away, David defiled these poor women. And really, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Nathan's prophecy in 2 Samuel 12, verse 11, he said, God says, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight." So these ten concubines suffer for Absalom's sin, and catch this, they also suffer for David's sin as well. You see, one of the biggest problems of sin, and I bet you'll agree with me in this, one of the biggest problems of sin, you can never tell how far the consequences will go. You never count on them going that far when you sinned. But yay, it goes much further many times than you could have imagined. So what's David going to do now? What does he do with these ten concubines? Well, one of the commentators named Clark, I think he, he lines it out well. He says, he could not divorce them. He could not punish them as they had done nothing wrong. He could not become more familiar with them because they had been defiled by his son. And to have married them to other men might have been dangerous to the state. So David puts them, basically, he, he retires them, if you will. They take an early retirement, but they're widows in the house. And you should note back at that time, especially among the ancients, to be a concubine sounds pretty bad, perhaps, but to the ancients, it was, it was a mark of honor, if you will, that you were a concubine to the king, but no more. But I would note perhaps a bright spot here. Maybe this is David's repentance, this could be David's repentance. As far as we know, it's an argument from silence either way, but David doesn't take concubines after this. Um, we don't see that in the text. He's, it said that he does not um, uh, become familiar with them again, and he's done. Uh, perhaps this is David's repentance coming forth, bearing fruit. I don't know. He does take care of them, though, which is, which is good. But continuing on, verse 4 through 7, Then the king said to Amasa, Call out the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to call out the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which he had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue them so that he does not find for himself fortified cities and escape from our sight. So Joab's men went out after him, along with the Cherethites and Pelethites. Those, by the way, are the Philistines, strangely enough, David's personal bodyguard, uh, and all the mighty men. And they went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So David has demoted Joab. Uh, so he replaces him with Amasa, which is interesting. David has demoted his nephew, Joab, and he's going to go with another uh, nephew, Amasa. Amasa was the one who led Absalom's uh, army. So uh, what we see here, though, is Amasa's name. I would encourage you not to name your child Amasa. It means burden. Perhaps you might nickname your teenage child Amasa, but <laughs> don't name him that. Amasa, it, it means burden, and it really fits here. David has put him in charge, and yet he's very slow in gathering the men to go fight against Sheba. Uh, so what he does is David bypasses Amasa and goes with Abishai. Abishai is Joab's younger brother, uh, and they take off to pursue Sheba. Now you may wonder, the text doesn't tell us, what took Amasa so long to gather the people? Well, maybe he was a procrastinator. Or perhaps the men didn't want to fight under him because they knew that he had led Absalom's men. We just don't know. Verse 8 through 10. When they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, six miles north of Jerusalem, Amasa came to meet him, meet them. 
Now Joab was dressed in his military attire, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath, fastened at its waist, and as he went forward, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, It is well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard against the sword which was in Joab's hand. So he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground. It did not strike him again, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. So it's a tragedy here that's taking place. Amasa apparently shows up with some troops. Joab, who is now demoted, is no longer wearing his general's uniform. He's dressed as a soldier. He advances to meet Amasa. Once again, these are first cousins. They know each other well. They grew up with each other. As Joab comes forward, he drops his sword, uh, which we'll see is not on accident. He picks it up with his left hand. And by the way, uh, you should read Josephus' account of this. It's not better than the Bible, to be clear. But he, makes it, he says that this was all happened simultaneously. And certainly that's what the text bears itself out. Uh, he drops the sword as he's picking it up with his left hand. Uh, he comes forward. Uh, he says, how are things, my brother? And he, interesting, he takes uh, Amasa's uh, beard in his right hand, which seems to be not uh, an act of aggression, but certainly uh, an act of love. Uh, Amasa would not expect a blade in Joab's left hand because that's not the hand that you fought with. You fought with your right hand, uh, by and large. Uh, and so, unless you happen to be left-handed, you might be a Benjamite or a strange person in this congregation. So, he, right hand, okay? So he comes for the battle, uh, but he actually goes for his face. So Amasa thinks, oh, he's, he's greeting me kindly. This is a Middle Eastern greeting. But you know what? It's heinous. And some of your minds are already traveling to the New Testament where you saw Judas do the same thing to Christ. Uh, we don't see him perhaps uh, take his beard, but in all likelihood he may have. That may have been the traditional greeting. What we see here, Joab is committing his third murder. Abner, Absalom, Amasa, and perhaps even a fourth murder if you could see that he was implicated in the death of Uriah. The Talmud puts it like this, commit a sin tw uh, twice and it will not seem to thee like a crime. And certainly if you look at your own life, the sins that you commit, you keep committing them over and over again, it doesn't feel like so bad as much. Ecclesiastes 8.11 puts it this way, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. David should have executed Joab in the past, but he has said before, these sons of Zariah are too powerful for me. Indeed, they may have been, but he should have followed the Old Testament law. So what we see here is Joab does a very cowardly thing. He could have at least challenged Amasa, but he doesn't. He murders him. And yet, be careful. Don't feel too sorry for Amasa. Remember, he himself opposed the Lord's anointed as he stood with Absalom. So right now we're seeing take place Sheba's rebellion, but you're catching the second rebellion, aren't you? It's a covert rebellion. It's not open, it's covert. It's Joab's rebellion. Indeed, it is a double rebellion. One of the commentators named Davis writes this, Joab is both intensely loyal and completely uncontrollable. He does not revolt against David like Sheba, nor seek David's throne like Absalom. Joab does not try to become king, and yet he acts as his own king. He is extremely loyal to David, but essentially unsubmissive to David. The double rebellion is a combination of Sheba, who wants to leave the Davidic kingdom behind, and Joab, who will not be controlled within the kingdom, but is ever hacking and slicing away to keep his own position unrivaled. So what you're seeing here, I think, is a spillover in principle. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, there is such a thing as acknowledging the king's sovereignty and disregarding his will. Such folks will have no place in the kingdom. And this is Joab. Joab is an enigma to many. Joab seems incredibly loyal. He just won't do what the king says to do. 
Verse 11 through 15. Now there stood by him one of Joab's young men and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. But Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa from the highway into the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came by him stood still. As soon as he was removed from the highway, all the men passed on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, even Beth Maaka, and all the Beerites, we don't know who the Beerites are, perhaps people who lived up north, and they were gathered together and also went after him. They came and besieged him in Abel Beth Maaka, and they cast up a siege ramp against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab were wrecking destruction in order to topple the wall. So here we see the men clearly want to follow Joab. They do that, and yet in the meantime, they stop to take note at this horrible murder that has just taken place. Amasa indeed seems to be dying in the throes of death, and Amasa's name fits him again, sadly. He's a burden. What do you do with the burden at the middle of the highway? You take it off the highway, and that's what they do. They move him, they throw a garment over him, and then everybody follows Joab. They go way up north in Beth Maaka. That's northern Israel, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Unlike Absalom, I think you're seeing, Sheba is not as well supported because he's way up north. He's obviously not gathered the support that Absalom did, but it's still a rebellion. And Joab and his men are building a battering ram to tear down the walls. Uh, as the city goes, so the traitor goes, okay? So the city's going to be destroyed unless somebody steps up. Verse 16 through 20. Then a wise woman called from the city, Here, here, please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. So he approached her and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I'm listening. Then she spoke, saying, Formerly they used to say they will surely ask advice of Abel. And thus that they ended the dispute. I am of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You are seeking to destroy a city, even a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Joab replied, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. <laughs> Which is rich irony, right? <laughs> He's just murdered a man. I, and Joab said, No, no, I don't want to destroy. I'm not interested. That's not me. And we'll note this, this woman is savvy. What a wise woman she is. She, is, she is actually going to be the hero of the city. Uh, why? Because she has biblical wisdom. And I think it's important to note, sometimes when we consider the word wisdom, uh, we listen to what the world has to say about it. And it sounds more like pragmatism. But y'all, that's not biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom is godly. It is peaceable. It is gentle. It's lined out in James 3. Uh, it says, says this, that true wisdom is peaceable. It's reasonable. It's full of mercy and good deeds. Uh, and she's doing the town right. She's going to save men, women, and children. Uh, Payne, one of the commentators, writes about wisdom. The Old Testament rarely separates the intellectual from the pragmatic. Wisdom is not simply knowing, but also doing What's it saying? He's saying ultimately wisdom is not just having some sort of understanding of Scripture. It's doing. It's, it's following through on it. James 3.13 says it like this, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. She's portraying this very well. Let's find out what happens. Verse 21 and 22 Joab says, Such is not the case, but a man from the hill country of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has lifted up his hand against King David. Only hand him over, and I will depart from the city. The woman said to Joab, Behold, his city, or rather his head, will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the wise woman uh, wisely came to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the trumpet. And they were dispersed from the city, each to his tent. Joab also returned to the king at Jerusalem. 
So Joab just tells the woman, give me Sheba. And her response, heads up. (laughs) That was too easy, I'm sorry. But would you note this? The last phrase of verse 22, Joab returns to the city, returns to the king. David has still not dealt with Joab. And Joab has now killed his nephew. Well, the punishment sleeps for now. And yet it will come in due time. As the wicked will soon know. But it's not today. And so we trust the Lord. Finally, verse 23 through 26 gives you a record of the government of David. Now, Joab was over the whole army of Israel and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and Pelethites. And Adoram was over the forced labor. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. And Sheva was scribe. And Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira, the Jerite, was also a priest to David, or royal advisor, perhaps his chaplain, if you will. Um, why is it including this last part here? Is there, are these just words? Just No, no. What you're going to see here is the kingdom is still standing. It's filled with sinful people. And yet the Lord is building. He's doing His work uh, in David, through David, in spite of David. And certainly that we see an indication of this is the way the church is. When you take a look at the church throughout the centuries, some years, decades, we don't look at all like the church of Jesus Christ. And yet the Lord keeps building as He Himself does it through us, in us, in spite of us. If you haven't come to a place, knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you need to see this. You are a wicked sinner, deserving of hell. Yea, you are on your way. And any sort of good deeds you've done by being baptized, by seeking to keep the law, are nothing more than paving stones on the way to the lake of fire. My encouragement to you today is flee to the cross. Come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Forsaking your sin and owning Him as He will then own you, your great shepherd. And we know for a fact that one day He will split the sky and He will come back and we will be renewed. Not just the Spirit, which happens at the point of justification, but our whole new glorified bodies. We will look upon Christ. For the believers, or perhaps unbelievers today, take a look at these three scenarios. Which one looks most like you in the narrative? We have the rebellion of Sheba. He's still rebelling against the Lord's anointed. And yet it's not Sheba anymore. It's perhaps, well, perhaps it could be your name. And you think perhaps that you are just sitting here today for a friend, but you can't wait to get out of here. Psalm 2, verse 4, it says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at you today. Because you continue to be the rebel. God has not called you to it. It's you on your own. And one day you will lose. Indeed, you will lose your head. That's the rebellion of Sheba. Then there's also this rebellion of Joab. The rebellion of Joab, as I mentioned earlier, it's a covert rebellion. Most folks wouldn't even see it. Perhaps they would look at Joab as a very faithful servant of the king. But to remind you of Matthew 7, 21, not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter to the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, to be very clear, we don't teach perfectionism here. Every day we fail to follow through on the Lord's will. But what I'm telling you, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it's the practice of your life, the bent of your life. Does it look more like Jesus Christ? Does it look more like the father of darkness? That's what we are referring to. Because certainly believers uh, stumble all the way. Our life of sanctification is up and down and up and down. And yet the fact of the matter is, is that a true believer gets back on the horse and keeps riding to the king. Finally, maybe you're like the wise woman, and that's just God's grace completely. God's grace in your life. And by God's Spirit, you want to eradicate this traitor that is in your city. You want to to do that, but the only way to do that is to cut his head off. You see, 
those sins that continue to find soft ground perhaps in our hearts that the Lord hates, we tend to nurse those. Keep them close. And I'm telling you, the only way to get rid of those, you have to cut its head off. Let me use the words of Christ. Matthew 5.30, if your right hand causes you to stumble, what? Cut it off. And throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Certainly, Jesus is not telling you that if you don't lose those sins, you will go to hell. But the point of it is, is that a true believer cuts off hands, cuts off feet, cuts off heads, those things, those sins that find enjoyment in our lives. We know that ultimately that's through the work of the Spirit, so we thank Him for it. The old Puritan trap put it this way, every man's breast is a city enclosed. Every sin is a traitor that lurks within those walls. God calls for Sheba's head. He has no quarrel with us as a person, but only for our sin. One more Puritan, Owen, put it like this way, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Well, thankfully, this is the Lord's work in us, through us, in spite of us. And so if you are in Christ today, you can enjoy that the great shepherd is leading you, even through dark paths, but he's making you more like himself. That great shepherd of the sheep, can we sing his praise today? Psalm 23, if you will, please rise in the songs of praise book. Afterwards, I will close in a benediction. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.